Hello, I'm Timothy Hobbs, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the Active Maintainers License. So, the Active Maintainers License is a new license that I'm developing because I am not really satisfied with the options available to me in terms of FLOSS licenses and their compatibility with business models or the ability to earn money making floss. Floss has a lot of advantages over proprietary software. It's great for collaboration. Of course, there's no vendor lock-in. Anyone can use the code and you're guaranteed access. So you don't have to worry about your, uh, the company that you're getting software from going bankrupt and or changing their business model and just leaving you with no access to your files or no ability to open your files and read them or no ability to just continue doing what you are currently doing. So what is the active maintainers license? The active maintainers license is a license that gives you rights. It lets you copy the software, archive the software, develop and modify the software, sell or license uh, changes to the software, publish the software, but it doesn't give you the right to use the software unless you are an active maintainer of the software or you pay an active maintainer or you get the right to use the software from an active maintainer of the software. What is an active maintainer or who is an active maintainer? Well, anyone can become an active maintainer. And this is very important to uh, one of the key properties that makes Floss great, which is guaranteed access and no vendor lock-in. So two key properties that we want to maintain are no vendor lock-in and guaranteed access. And we do that by me making it so that anyone can become an active maintainer not just somebody who is uh, somehow mm, certified by the original developers of the software, not somebody who sub-licenses that right from the original developers in some special way that requires the original developers to agree to it, but literally anyone can become an active maintainer. And what do you have to do to prove that you're an active maintainer or how do you become an active maintainer? Well, you have to maintain the software and you have to prove that you're maintaining the software and you prove that you're maintaining the software by recording screencasts of you performing that maintenance work, whether it's writing documentation or adding tests, uh, doing profiling on the software, fixing bugs, writing new features, any of those things would be considered maintenance of the software. Um, your work, when you record it on the screencast, is measured in hours per person doing the work. Uh, and any result of that work must be released under the same license. And so in order to use the software, you need to either maintain the software or pay somebody to maintain the software. And as they do that, the software will improve because that work that they're doing to become, to prove that they're doing maintenance is being licensed under the active maintainer's license and is being released publicly, just like the screencast that they record will be released publicly. So anyone can verify who is an active maintainer. How many hours do you have to work per month in order to, uh, prove or in order to qualify as an active maintainer. Well, if I were to just set an arbitrary number, for example, 10 hours a month, then a very large soft piece of software, the likes of Firefox, would it wouldn't make sense for that very large software that somebody would gain the right to use it for so little maintenance investment. But a very small piece of software that wasn't very important couldn't have it set as a minimum of a thousand hours a month because that just wouldn't make sense. And so I've created a kind of tiered system in which there's a 
default minimum maintenance investment of four hours per month for a work. And that is if you're the sole maintainer of the work uh, and you're using code that has been kind of abandoned. It hasn't been changed in eight months or you're using code that hasn't been abandoned, but it happens to not have been changed in eight months because you're using an old version of that code. So the four hour per month minimum is kind of this default. But if a maintainer works more than four hours per month, they can set a new minimum. So if I work 10 hours per month on a software and I, want, and I don't want people to be able to use my new changes uh, unless they also put in some work, then I can set the minimum to, for example, eight hours per month or nine hours per month or 10 hours per month up to the amount of investment that I'm putting in myself. And so uh, I will, can set this new minimum, but I can't set it too high. I can't set it absurdly high. It can't exceed my own investment. And this investment, when I say I, I can be referring to one person, a group of people who all agree on the same terms of use that agree to collaborate on active maintenance as a group or a company or a joint venture or whatever what have you. Any group of people, any person or group of people who agree to the same usage terms can be considered as an entity an active maintainer. Uh, so what this allows is this allows for collaboration. Anyone can copy, uh, publish, develop and modify the software, and anyone can gain the right to use the software by investing enough time into the software, a somewhat equal amount of time to the other maintainers. And if they don't have the resources to invest that much time, they can always pay another active maintainer to gain the right to use it. And they, if there's more than one active maintainer, they can have a choice. And since software can be branched, it can be forked, then you could have one group of active maintainers who are each in the major leagues, uh, working hundreds of hours a month to maintain the software. And then you could have another fork, a set of maintainers who work much less per month and perhaps charge less for usage. Finally, there's one thing that I wanted to ensure, which is that if you install a piece of software on a computer or on a cell phone, and you've been using it and you've been paying for it for 12 months in a row and you're not changing, you're not updating the software. You don't have to uninstall it just because somebody who you were paying to maintain the software stopped maintaining it and they lost the right to license that usage right to you. Or that if you've been tirelessly maintaining the software for a year and then you don't have time anymore, you shouldn't be forced to stop using the software. And so I allow the usage right to be grandfathered after 12 months for unchanged software. And if you then want to update the software and there's somebody else maintaining the software, you can go and pay them for the right to start using the new versions again. So I think that's a very fair and uh, good right to add in order to solidify the third property that I'm trying to attain, which is guaranteed access. The AML, I, I wrote this slide yesterday. It's actually four days old now. It's a very new license. I haven't resolved all of the problems. One of the major problems with this model is that not everyone's time is equal. I've been developing software for many years and my time is worth more than somebody who started yesterday. And it doesn't make sense and it's not fair that their maintenance time should be valued at the same level as my maintenance time. Uh, and when I presented uh, this license a few days ago as a lightning talk at my local Python meetup, I was asked, could we solve this problem by allowing maintainers to judge or to have some outside judge that determined whose time was worth how much? And 
I don't think that is a solution that is possible because, as I said before, we need to guarantee access and we cannot have vendor lock-in. And if it was a subjective measure, then the maintainers who didn't want to allow others to use the software could simply not um, qualify their contributions as being valuable. So that wouldn't prevent vendor lock-in and it wouldn't guarantee access. And so I don't think that such a subjective measure is possible. One thing that like, I can imagine is that a company wants to gain the right to use the software and so they pay a bunch of people from a very cheap country to kind of pretend to maintain the software and they would do this in order to gain the legal right to use it and there's a couple of like circumstances that I can imagine. One circumstance is that the company is doing this so that they can gain usage rights um, for their own internal use. And the question is, at what point would their investment in paying this very cheap foreign labor be lower than the amount that a legitimate maintainer was willing to sell them the usage right for? And I don't know exactly what the balance is there, but I imagine that there could be a sort of balancing act. But, of course, the company who wants to use the software for their internal usage is going to gain a lot more value by paying an actual maintainer to actually maintain the software than to pay a bunch of fake people to pretend to maintain the software uh, from a low-wage country because when they pay an actual maintainer they get certain prioritization in terms of support and the ability to choose a roadmap that they wouldn't get if they were simply pretending to pay, maintain the software and it's not like paying people in a very cheap labor country to pretend to maintain software uh, is free. It still costs money. So they're going to be choosing. Am I going to spend $1,000 a month to pay somebody in Pakistan uh, to pretend to maintain the software, somebody who doesn't know how to program? Or should I pay $2,000 a month for uh, to pay the legitimate maintainer to maintain the software and perhaps even provide me some kind of support? I don't think that they're going to choose the $1,000 option very frequently. And if they do, I don't think that it's actually a tragedy because if that person in Pakistan is sitting there in front of the computer pretending to program, eventually they might actually learn how to program. And paying people to learn how to program is not such a horrible injustice in my mind. It's not like with Bitcoin where the proof of work is just burning energy uselessly. If we're paying people to fake maintaining software, then we're actually paying them to learn how to program. And that's, in my mind, not a bad thing. Who decides if a given screencast shows work being done? This is a difficult question because there is a lot of gray area where the person's writing documentation, they're just kind of like spewing out words, they're not really trying. Uh, there are some gray areas, of course, but if the person is not doing anything related to the work, the software, they're doing their laundry on video, for example, and you want to sue in court any copyright holder uh, of the work, which is anyone who's been actively maintaining the software uh, or the original authors, can sue under this license for copyright infringement and violation of the license. If the if a person is claiming to be a maintainer, or if a company is claiming to be a maintainer, they're uploading videos showing them not actually doing work on the software, and uh, then claiming that those videos show them, show them working on the software, and then they are using the software or selling the right to use the software, then they can be sued. And indeed, it's actually easier to sue them than in the case of a floss, uh, system because if, for example, they're selling the right to use the software and they're not legitimately allowed to use the software because they weren't actually working on the software in their screencasts, then it's an economic harm and that's very easy to show damages for. Uh, 
the next question is recording all of this all these screencasts of the software and recording how much time was spent maintaining the software is going to have a cost associated with it and that cost is non-null and so we could ask is this accounting going to increase the so cost of the software unreasonably and I think that there is an argument to be had that this is going to be somewhat costly, but knowing how much money, how much time and effort you've put into maintaining and developing software is actually a good thing. And knowing these numbers is not harmful. One question that I myself have about this license is what happens when you share or move code between projects? If you find a function written in the uh, uh, written and licensed under the AML license somewhere on the internet and you want to use it in your GPL licensed project can you i think you cannot according to the AML and i think that's a pity that it makes code non portable i do not have a good solution for this and i would love it if you have a great solution you don't have to come up with like nonsense solutions, but if you do think of a good solution, I would love to hear it because I can't think of one myself. I think that's a flaw or a defect in this license. One thing that I'd like to say is that the way that I've created the AML, it is not copyleft. If you make changes to the software, you do not need to release those changes, that new work, under the AML. And uh, if you... Uh, if you release it uh, under another, it's not like the GPL where you're forced to release it, uh, your changes under the GPL if you copy the software and you distribute it. Um, a maintainer can also make changes that they don't release under this license, but for the time that they're claiming as being public maintenance work, they do have to release it under this work under this license. So it is not a copyleft license and you can create like open core models and even maintainers can create open core models. I was speaking earlier about this question of uh, not everyone's time is uh, equal and uh, so not everyone's time is equal and the thing that I was saying earlier is if a company wanted to use the software and they chose instead to employ a large number of people in a low wage country to kind of fake maintain the software, then they could perhaps get the right to use the software for a lower amount than if they were to pay the legitimate maintainers. But another case is that a company might pay a bunch of inexperienced non-programmers a very low amount of money to fake maintain the software and sell usage rights to the software. But they'd still have a cost involved with paying those low wage workers. And so they'd either have to sell the software for a lower cost than the legitimate maintainers, or they'd have to add spyware and advertisements to the software. And the way capitalism works, people who are shady, people who don't care about ethics, don't care about ethics in a general sense. They don't feel ethical or they don't behave in an ethical way in some domains and not in others. And so, or at least I think that's generally true, though, uh, of course, ethics is kind of subjective. I, I've known very ethical people who consume meat, for example, and I don't consume meat because I don't find it ethical. Uh, but that's kind of a philosophical question. I think that in general, shady figures are less trustworthy. And if you see that somebody or some company is uploading a lot of screencasts showing them obviously not legitimately maintaining the software, and then you see another company who is a maintainer of the software uploading a bunch of high quality screencasts of them legitimately developing the software, I believe that you're going to trust the software from the legitimate maintainer more. And you're going to find, feel that if I get a copy of the software from this illegitimate maintainer, then chances are it's full of spyware. And so I think that's one way that, like, if you, since development is forced to be in the open, 
If you have a lot of people who are kind of illegitimately maintaining the software, you'll know about it. And you'll have kind of the premium option and the not so premium option. And when I say the premium option, one of the, one of the things that a maintainer can do is they can have a few small changes. So it's not going to be completely, uh, their, their work that they're selling the usage rights to is not going to be completely under the AML. And so the company that's illegitimate couldn't simply duplicate directly their work. But I want to compare the AML to copy left for a little bit and copy left business models. In copy left business models, uh, you often have this open core model uh, or, or even in permissive licenses, you often have this co open core model and the open core model does not allow for collaboration for the closed source parts. It has vendor lock-in for the closed source parts and it doesn't guarantee access. And uh, with copy left business models, where oftentimes the business model is selling the right to dual license the software, to selling the right to use the software for commercial uses and right proprietary add-ons to the software, the, that model is not mm, compatible with collaboration because in order to be able to sell the right to dual license the software, only one party can be the primary developer of the software. Uh, and they need to get all other contributors to sign an SLA. Uh, if the other contributors don't sell, uh, sign an SLA, then the party selling the commercial license, as it's often called, uh, l loses the right to sell that commercial license since the copyleft license prohibits it. But the uh, active maintainer's license, the AML, is, uh, it doesn't require a dual licensing business model. Uh, since it's not copy left and uh, it allows there to be multiple organiza organizations all commercially exploiting the software uh, and earning money being paid for maintaining and developing the software. So collaboration is much stronger on a commercial front than in floss with the AML. Uh, so that's all my slides. But I'd like to go and switch over to Emacs uh, and show you the actual license as I've written it. And I'd like to remind you that this draft is four days old and I haven't even spell checked it. So it's probably in a horrible shape. Section one, I'm not going to read section one. It is copied from, I believe the BSD license and this quotation mark is extraneous, uh, but it is the standard warranty disclaimer. Section two, basic rights. This work may be modified, copied, stored, or archived free of charge indefinitely. This work may be published, transferred to a third party at will. It may also be used for the purpose of developing or improving this work, but for no other purpose except in the cases described below. So that corresponds to this slide that anyone can copy, archive, sell license changes, publish, develop, and modify the work, but they can't use it without getting uh, that right from an active maintainer. Section three, maintainer rights. The right to use this work may be temporarily acquired by any person, group of persons, or legal entity which acts as an active maintainer of this work. This right lasts for the duration of their status as active maintainer and ends when they cease to be an active maintainer. Active maintainers may also sublicense their right to use this work to third parties and may do so for under any terms they deem fit. So that uh, kind of corresponds to this slide. So number four, uh, here I have a typo. Maintainer status. Status as an active maintainer is assessed on a month by month basis and usage rights apply to the month which follows the assessed month. Active maintainership is achieved via proof of work in the form of audio video recordings of the worker's screen 
or other medium used to engage in active maintenance. The products of any work performed in the course of providing active maintenance, as well as the video recordings of the work, must be made publicly available, free of charge, on an easily found web address, and under this license, within... Uh, I, I don't need the within one month of the work being done. That was an old idea. Since it's not copyleft, you're not actually required to release anything within any time frame. The only thing is that if you want to prove your work, then you have to release your work and the proof of the work. Five, maintenance minimums. So we've gotten onto this slide, maintenance minimums. The minimum maintenance investment defaults to four person hours per month for a work published under this license. Maintainers investing more than four hours a month may set a higher minimum, which applies to any improvements originating from that maintainer for seven months after those improvements are published. This minimum may not exceed the number of hours invested by the maintainer in the month preceding the announcement. Uh, minimums apply to the month that they are announced. Minimums must be announced by the fifth of each month. I was trying to figure out how this would work. Um, so I imagine that uh, you, you would have a website, each active maintainer would have a website where they upload the videos of them doing the screencasts and at the end of each month they they write down how many hours they put into the active maintenance and this proves, this gives them the, and if that um, uh, number of hours is the is at least as many hours as was the maintenance minimum published by all the other act maintainers that they're collaborating with, then they retain the right to continue to use the new changes published by those other maintainers. It's kind of complicated, but in, in my mind it works. In my mind it makes sense. That's just a matter of explaining to the rest of you how this works. Uh, minimums must be announced by the fifth of each month. So they would publish the amount they worked in the previous month, and then they would publish the amount that they expected you to work this month in order to continue in a third month to be allowed to use those new changes. And uh, the new changes in the third month. Uh, so every maintainer, on the, by the fifth, they would know how many hours they have to work that month in order to um, stay in the active maintainer's pool, basically, for that branch of the software. And if they fall out of that pool, then they'll have to pay the other maintainers some amount of money in order to uh, maintain the right to use the software. Or they could perhaps buy maintenance hours from freelancers in order to prevent themselves from falling out of the pool. So here we have number six, usage rights grandfathering. Uh, if a copy of this work is legally used on a computing device over the course of 12 months, the right to use that copy of the work on that device is grandfathered in. Once the right of use is grandfathered in, the work may continue to be used indefinitely on that computing device so long as no other changes, no changes to the work are made. Seven, grant of patent license. This is something that I did not talk about in the presentation, but it's an important aspect. And what I've done here is I went to the Apache license and I copied their patent grant clause, but I changed it significantly because the Apache patent grant uh, clause only applies to changes that were introduced by the patent holder. But I want to make patent grant apply to anything in the in the work uh, because I, I I don't know I, I'll have to think about that actually to be honest I think that maybe in the future this clause will change slightly 
Any contributing party which releases a work or a version of a work under this license grants a perpetual, worldwide, non-exclusive, no-charge, royalty-free, irrevocable, except as stated in this section, patent license to make, have made, use, offer, to sell, sell, import, or otherwise transfer the work where such license, which, where such license applies only to those patent claims licensable by such contributing party. Uh, if any party institutes patent litigation against any entity, including a cross-claim or counterclaim in a lawsuit, alleging that any part of the work constitutes direct or contributory patent infringement, then any patent license is granted on to the belligerent party under this license shall terminate as of the date such litigation is filed. So that's the current patent grant license. And... One kind of wonders if this is the correct thing or if the Apache model is better. Because right now we're saying that if the work contains your country, if you have any contributions in the work, then you're giving up uh, your right to sue for patent infringement kind of in a general sense. Because the work could be modified to infringe on that party, the, that contributing party's uh, patents without the contributing party's consent. And maybe the Apache model's better, in which the contributing party would only be granting the right to use patents that apply to their contributions. I'm not sure there. Finally, I have two final sections, or three sections. Um, eight, referring to this license, this re license may be referenced as the AML GR0 draft, AML being the license name, GR being the suffix, that stands for Gradesta, my company, and Zero Draft being the license version. Nine, copying, modifying, and using this license. You may use this license text under the terms of the Creative Commons 4 International Attribution License with one condition. If you modify this license, you must change the license suffix. So I don't want people copying this file modifying it, and then uh, releasing their work under it, calling it the Active Maintainer's License GR0. I would prefer if you do modify this license and then use it to license your work, that you would refer to it as the Active Maintainer's minus some other two-letter suffix. So if, for example, if your company is called uh, Spotify, then it might be the Active Maintainer's License SP uh, license to distinguish it. If you don't make any changes to the license, you're free to refer to it as the GR0, but please do not um, confuse people by creating a bunch of licenses with the same name and the same suffix. That's just not nice. Um, finally, I include the credits that I created this license. So, Thank you for watching. I, I hope that this presentation kind of uh, inspires a discussion about the possibility of creating an active maintainer's license. I do not intend this presentation to be an announcement that you should intend, immediately go out and start using this license because I do think that there are some problems with this license that might need to be worked out before it's ready for prime time. But I do want to start a discussion, and I do hope that you enjoyed my presentation. Goodbye.